look at one exhibition in depth today, and another one we're just going to sort of browse through. The one we're going to look at in depth is Peter Sarkisian, Video Works, 1996 to 2008. Um, and one of the things about uh, my job that I love is the opportunity to bring in exhibitions that represent ideas and objects that are new and different for me. I don't have a lot of uh, background and experience with, with video art. Uh, the programs that I was involved in, both undergrad and grad, really didn't have a whole lot of, uh, of curriculum that dealt with new media. And so working here and being able to be involved with uh, exhibitions like this it gives me a chance to learn more about this whole other world that's become increasingly important in uh, the art world today. And Peter Sarkisian is a practitioner who came out of a filmmaking background. He's from Santa Fe, and one of his main missions as an artist was to break out from the flat surfaces that have really sort of imprisoned uh, video and film over the years. Uh, whether you're looking at it in a flat monitor or a projected image on the wall, uh, Sarkisian is really interested in trying to figure out a way to free that imagery and combine it with sculpture so that it can be more participatory and really affect us in a stronger way. Uh, next slide. So this show will be in both lower galleries. Uh, it's a very complicated installation. Clark Gillespie, uh, assistant curator here, was showing me about a half inch stack of paper that Peter sent that includes specifications on the installation of only 10 works. And so for each one, there are all kinds of specifications around the kind of structure you have to build to mount it, or the positioning of projectors, uh, other kinds of site preparations that uh, are gonna be very challenging for us, but also very exciting. This is one of the earliest works in the show. It's called Sleep Defined. And what it is is a pillow-like sculpture uh, that's placed on the gallery floor. And there's a projector that shoots an image down onto it that makes it look as if there's a pillowcase that is wrinkled. And as you watch, you see the wrinkles shift and change as if there's something underneath the pillowcase that is alive and moving. And as you watch this motion, you hear the sounds of deep sleep breathing. So he's introducing that element of sound, which is so important to many video artists, as a way of engaging the viewer in a much more profound way. And so many of the works in this exhibition have a sound component. Some are very subtle. Uh, some are, as you'll see, uh, much more aggressive and, and, and loud. Uh, next image. Now, many of you may remember a couple of years ago, we had work by Peter included in a video exhibition, yes. Video Art, Three Visions. And the work in question was uh, this cube about three by three by three feet called Dusted. And uh, here you'd see an opaque dark cube. And for those of you who weren't here and didn't see it, uh, you begin to see little patches of light appear. And then you realize there's something inside the cube. and then more light would shine through and eventually you had enough of an area that you could see that there were two figures that had been trapped inside the small space and they were constantly moving around trying to get comfortable <coughs> and as they moved their new bodies were hitting the outside of the cube and wiping off the pigment that was on the outside of each surface and so eventually what happens is the cube goes from being dark to having all the pigment on them and the cube is completely uh, transparent. And then the cycle continues. And it was uh, a work that was achieved by the use of several projectors, one for each of these panels. And this plexiglass cube more or less uh, becomes this complex multi-projector work of art that uh, again creates the illusion that there's something right there inside of you, uh, right there in front of you moving around. There's a related piece from the same series that we're going to be getting next slide. So are we getting the dusted or not? No. No. It was part of the original show, but when I saw it on the checklist, I talked to the organizing museum and I said, we showed this here just a couple of years ago. Okay. Might we be able to get something else or at oh, least okay. leave it out of the show? Okay. And it turns out that the first uh, thing we decided to do was let's just leave it out of the show. We'll have 
more room for the nine installations we're getting. Uh, and then Peter emailed Chris and said, yeah, I heard that you guys were uh, leaving Dusted out, that's fine, but I really would like to have another piece in the show that's from that same time frame that has gotten me a lot of uh, visibility and I'd love to have it in this show. And so we arranged to bring into this exhibition, just for KMA, this work called Hover from 1999. And you can see it's a similar format. It's this uh, cube that's about three by three by three feet. And instead of having the opaque surfaces and the figures moving around and revealing themselves, uh, you begin by seeing uh, a woman and a child. You know, mother and child is uh, again, one of those subjects in art history that appears again and again from the earliest times on. And here, Sarkeesian is using that timeless uh, image as the basis for a study in um, motion and tension and this feeling of entrapment. You know, normally when we think about mother and child, it's this pleasing, soothing uh, interaction that dominates uh, the tone of the work. Here, the figures appear to be, again, trapped inside this cube, and then as you watch the cube, it begins to turn and move faster and faster as the figures become more anxious, trying to get out and find some method of escape. You'll notice here, too, unlike uh, this work, in Dusted, you really didn't have any sense of a background in the work. All you really saw were the two figures moving around in this light-filled cube. Here you can see the recession of the cube as if you're looking through it. You can see the inside of the cube's structure. So that's another difference between the two works. And in some ways, this whole body of Peter's work, uh, the, the cubes, is almost a play on cubism because cubism was trying to more or less take a flat surface and represent imagery as if you were walking around the subject, but then somehow translating that back onto a flat surface. Here he's taking the flat surfaces of this plexiglass cube and using separate projections to give you the feeling of, again, seeing things from all sides. Next image. Hands at a table is an ordinary table that's uh, sitting in the gallery, and then projected down onto it are hands that uh, appear in different sequences. And according to what I remember, the large hands appear first, and then you'll see the smaller hands appear, and they begin to more or less create rhythms. The large hands appear to be in the lead, setting the tone, and then the small hands follow. Uh, you might look at this and it might give you the sense of a family around a, a table doing some sort of a communal activity. Um, and perhaps these are children's hands, but if you look at them carefully, they are all the same set of hands, just the scale has been changed. And again, this is another work that incorporates sound. Next image. Green Puddle. Uh, Peter did a series of works involving this resin that can be poured allowed to dry in any shape. And so this is a piece of resin in that same contour that we laid onto the gallery floor. And then above it, shining down, would be a projected image that made it appear as if this puddle was the result of droplets coming down from above. And so as you look at this image with the changing ripple pattern, uh, you hear the sound of, of dripping water or fluid of some kind. Next slide. Similarly, this later work from 2003, Blue Boiling in a Pail, is an actual metal pail. There's a resin surface, and then onto that resin surface is the projection of the sound of bubbling. And again, you're looking down at this object, you're seeing the bubbling, you're hearing the sound above you, and there's this, uh, this feeling of well, the sound's up there, but the image is down there. That's, something intentional. He could have built a speaker into the bucket if he wanted to, but uh, a lot of what he's doing is trying to get viewers to become more aware of the space that they're in and to question the connection between what they see and what they hear. And so with a number of the works in the exhibition, uh, there's going to be that feeling of, I'm not just looking at this self-contained work of art with the sound and the sight and the motion all right there. It's going to be, I'm seeing this, but I'm aware of the equipment and I'm hearing something from over here and 
uh, it seems like there's something from there that's affecting this. It's really creating this interactive environment, and that's what he's really trying to do. Break away from flat screens and make viewers uh, more aware of, of the art environment in Toto. Next image. And this is a great example, probably the best example on the show. Uh, a simple glass of water, apparently, uh, sitting on a table. And it's illuminated. And what happens is, if you stand near it, you see this illumination, this uh, area of light, and it appears to shift. And the feeling you get is that you're in this dark gallery looking at this glass of, of water, and as the light shifts, it gives you the impression that there is someone else in the gallery with you holding a flashlight or some light source and is moving around you and it's like, where are they? How is this happening? And Clark was telling me that Peter had to go to great trouble to create a glass with a certain shape and that most of the glasses we drink out of are slightly flared and that evidently if he had used a glass like that because he wanted it to look like an ordinary glass that the wider profile here would have cast a ring that would have destroyed the illusion. So he had to create a glass that was slightly sloped inward so that the top lip didn't create that uh, strange ring. And so what happens is this ring here falls precisely where the ring here is. And that's why it had to be narrow because you had to account for this distance here. So, Little adjustments like that are what Peter has to wrestle with in order to make the kind of subtle illusions that he's going after. Uh, next slide. Here's one where there are two panels attached to the wall. And at first, they're blank. It just looks like they're two squares of light. And then as you watch, you hear a noise. And it's a thud pounding. And then with each of the large pound mix, you'll see a dent. And it looks as if there's someone on the other side of the space from where you're standing who is trying to escape from a prison that they're in, or they're trying to get in where you are. And it's sort of a feeling of uncertainty, of anxiety, there's a perceived threat, I think, at some point, once the pounding becomes intense enough and you begin to see a number of dents. It makes me think back to some sci-fi movies where uh, someone's trying to run away from something, they close the door, and this big powerful thing is trying to pound its way through. It's that same kind of, of reaction that we have. And so that's pounding study. Next mm -hmm. image. This is one of the more complex works. Uh, I mentioned how Peter's really tried to explore the introduction of, of sculptural elements and merging those with video projections. And here's one where he has taken a special type of plastic. It's actually the kind of you can buy presents for kids at uh, Christmas time. You've got those Mattel toys where you've got an uh, action figure or something. You've got that clear plastic that's been molded over it. It's the same kind of thing, but this is a sort of a translucent or semi-opaque plastic that's been, again, vacuumed over a very specific form that Peter's built. And so this is fairly thin, it's light, and then this piece of plastic would be attached to the wall. There would be a cutout in the wall, and then there is projected imagery coming from behind. And if you look at the next slide, you'll see what this is able to produce. So there are several projectors, six in total, that are, are focused on the back of this cutout piece of translucent plastic that transform it into this so-called extruded video engine. He made a series of these. This is shape one, version three. And when this thing is running, <clears throat> you'll see a little running script that appears to be fed through the engine. Uh, all these parts are moving and whirring, and you look like you're looking at a real functional engine. Uh, but again, you've got this bizarre little script. It's very much sort of like stream of consciousness uh, commentary. Next image. Here's a front view of it. Again, the pistons are pushing up and down. 
a lot of these gears are turning, everything appears to be integrated and moving, and then this channel right here, which is empty in this shot, um, sometimes it will have script like you see up there. Next image. Here's another one where he's played around with the notion of video games as being one edge of reality, the real world that we're in, and then a video projection somewhere between those two worlds. So you've got the projector back here, you have an actual car door, and then in the window, looking into the driver, you see what looks to be a real person behind the wheel. And when you look beyond them through the opposite window, that's where you're seeing imagery from a video game. It's a race car video game. And what happens is the driver is driving along, and really you can tell from the sound of the screeching tires, they're driving pretty recklessly. And they will drive by and hear them collide into parked cars and screech through intersections. And you know, the guy appears fairly calm, but it gives you that sense of anxiety because you're wondering what's going to happen. Is he going to eventually have a head-on collision with an 18-wheeler? And you know, what will happen then? Um, so it's this, uh, again, this, this weird duality where you've got the video game, you've got the projected imagery based on filming an actual actor, and you've got us in the real space looking into the side of this car door. Uh, before he created this large version, he had experimented with wall-mounted car models that had smaller windows and smaller drivers. And so eventually he liked the idea, let's see if we can make something that's closer to, to full size. Next image. <clears throat> this one's called foreground reversal. And it's, it's one of the few that has a uh, any kind of a, a social component to it, social commentary, political references. Um, this one deals with illegal immigrants who are uh, walking along a border, more or less. And you can't really tell from this slide image, but there is a three-dimensional sculptural component. Uh, as far as I understand it, the rocks are all built in 3D out of that vacuum-formed plastic. And so you have projected imagery of, again, the, the structure of the rocks, their grain and structure, all the pitted surfaces. And then above that, you would have a flat projection of these migrant workers or immigrants who are moving back and forth across the top of the rocks. And again, it's this whole notion of exploring barriers, how to get across one border to another. It's sort of a metaphor for what Sarkisian is trying to do with marriage and video and sculpture, freeing video from that flat surface, moving it into new territory. Next image. I, I thought it'd be good to show uh, Sarkisian's work in the context of work by other video artists because I don't want, I don't think Peter would either, I don't want anyone to believe that Peter's the only one doing this. Uh, video art, if you show the first slide. Video art has been around for fairly long time, in the mid-1960s, um, the Portapak was developed. It was basically a handheld video camera with a separate recorder, and it really gave artists a chance to use a video camera and more or less be fairly free and flexible to move around and to capture everyday life. Um, one of the artists who was involved in buying one of the first Portapaks was Nam Jun Paik, a Korean artist who died a few years ago. And if you look at these three works, it's sort of a cross-section of what he's done. One of the things that he's, he was fascinated by was the way that television and film had transformed our world and how pervasive particularly TV was, the way that satellite dishes were able to bring all these different worlds together at one time in one place. And so one of the things that he really tried to do was to he realized that for many of us, because TV is everywhere, we sort of look beyond the actual structure of the TV. We're so lost in the world within that screen. He wants to bring our attention back to the medium itself, to the TV as a structural object. And if you look at um, the image here on the left, he wants to reveal the truth of the TV. And so what you have here is an old console TV there is a large, powerful magnet mounted on top of it, and this strange, abstract-looking image. That's, in fact, 
real footage of Richard Nixon. And when the magnet is applied on top of that cathode ray tube, it distorts the information. And so it reveals the fact that uh, television is all about this electronic signal. And so he's scrambling and interfering with that signal to destroy the illusion and remind us what we're really looking at. Um, his groundbreaking work in the middle, TV cello, he uses television monitors in a way that uh, almost Again, gives them this feeling of, of a figure. Uh, and this is a very interactive work, too, because he hired a famous cellist, Charlotte Norman, to sit there. The, the monitors are actually strapped to her. And then as she played, the wires and the music affected the sequence of images. And so uh, she was literally uh, shaping the video, the sequence of images, just through her activity and her playing. On the right is a shot that I took in um, Mark and Lydia Strauss's living room. They own this work called Global Encoder, a fairly late work by Pike. And it's uh, one where this robot has an umbrella that's shaped like, again, it's a satellite dish. And each of these is a television monitor. Again, he's using the television itself as a sculptural structure. Uh, that's something you find in, in most of his work. And the imagery in the screens is not narrative. It tends to be uh, imagery that's broken down into short sequences where it's more about form and color and rhythm than it is about watching a whole video that takes you somewhere and brings you back. Next image. I just want to show you uh, this work on the left by Nam Jun Paik and then the work on the right by Sarkisian. Again, uh, on the left, you know, the work still shows you the monitor, you see the Sony label. Uh, he's really reminding you what you're looking at. It's the truth of the medium. Uh, he's got an Oldsmobile hubcap in the middle, but it's very much sort of like this, this engine. And on the right, of course, Sarkisian's work, where it's all about the projection and this thermal plastic. Uh, very different approach, but I felt like the sensibilities were kind of going in the same direction. Next slide. Uh, Bill Viola is another very video artist, but again, his approach is, is very different from Sarkisian's. Uh, Viola on the left, like Sarkisian, is involved in <coughs> installation formats where he has these actual barrels in which you've got monitors that have been placed, and each monitor shows real video of someone asleep. And so this is called the sleepers. Um, makes me think again of Sarkisian's pillows and the sound of, of the sleepers. On the right is the locked garden. Uh, it's a diptych of flat screen uh, plasma screens, basically very high resolution plasma screens. And there's slow motion video of two faces. And what happens is when you look at these, at first you're thinking, oh, it's a you know, husband and wife uh, photographic portraits that are sitting there on the shelf like you'd see in anyone's home. Um, but again, as you watch, you begin to see their emotions and their expressions change ever so slightly. And so what's interesting here is that if you look at the history of academic art, uh, you see artists, painters, trying to refine their styles so that uh, they lay pigment onto a flat surface in a way that makes you think you're seeing this illusion of real life, trying to get it as real and photographic as possible. And yet here you've got a video artist who's taking a video medium based in film and is trying to make it appear painterly or like it's a painting instead of a video or an electronic material and medium. And so that's really what Val has been concerned with. He's very much involved with dualities. We go to the next slide. <clears throat> You'll see here uh, you've got these large projections and then below them are slabs of granite. And so in work like this there are suggestions of birth and these human figures suspended or immersed in water as if they're in the womb. Um, at the same time these slabs with the images of those same projections down on them make you think of maybe a death context. And above, you've got more of those uh, LCD panels with hands gesturing, and each one, again, really tries to go back to uh, 
vital this emphasis on human emotion and how hands are so important in conveying emotions from anger to anxiety to uh, states of relaxation. Next slide. And so if you look at the work by Baola on the top, again, you can see the Sarkeesians dealing with similar uh, anatomies, but in very different ways. His is all about rhythm, it's about sound, whereas this is very tranquil and meditative and more concerned with human emotion. And one of the things that you'll notice in Sarkeesian's work, or if you read about him, <coughs> you realize that the further on in his career that he goes, the more he realizes that human figures are not critical to the work. It's more or less suggesting human presence. And so uh, you would not, in his recent works, ever see human hands anymore. More than likely, you might hear pounding of hands or drumming of fingers, but he, he wants to make the presence of, of a human figure more implied than specific. Next slide. Another video artist who, like Sarkisian, has tried to bring together the worlds of installation, sculpture, and video is Tony Horsler. <clears throat> Here's a slide of a fairly recent work of his that uh, again gives you an idea of what he's capable of. Really dramatic, exciting works that deal with the human figure. Next slide. And unlike Sarkisian, Horsler is very much uh, focused on the human figure, particularly faces and eyes. Uh, one of his earliest bodies of work dealt with these small doll-like figures where you have basically a stuffed doll head, uh, very plain in its surface, and he would project an image onto that, and the image often had some sort of a, a soundtrack, or it would say uh, a loop of, of phrases. Uh, in some cases, you might find a doll like that with its head trapped between a suitcase, like I did one time when I went to a collector's home, I was like, what is that sound? And I walked around and I saw a doll about like that with a suitcase lying on top of its head, and it was sort of saying things like, help me, and then after it would say, help me a few times, it would roll into reciting some Emily Dickinson poetry, things like that that were you know, very much concerned with, with absurdity, with uh, dysfunctional society, and uh, in some cases making environmental statements, like the work on the bottom right, where you've got a, a large drum, you've got this extruded uh, resin, there's a video image onto that, and it's called Kipong. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but Kipong, from what I read, was basically this uh, insecticide used in the 60s and 70s against ants and other kinds of insect pests. And it turned out to be uh, highly toxic and um, really created a lot of environmental damage. And so, again, occasionally he will make statements that uh, move along those lines. The work on the left, is again, you look at it, you're thinking, where's the video? It's mostly sculpture. But if you look through the opening in the ground and then the opening in the tower, uh, there are small video screens there that again uh, keep video and sculpture in this uh, interesting matrix. And he's often playing with scale. We saw in that first image the eyes that were uh, really large orbs, and then here the screens become quite small. So playing with scale is, is very important to uh, force that. Next image. And again, uh, I thought it'd be interesting to show both of these. The work on the left is by Horstler. Here we're seeing two important video artists who are addressing in their work the history of painting. Uh, on the right, more or less Renaissance painting, uh, photography, portraiture. Uh, on the left, abstract expressionism. This is a cut out piece of aluminum with this uh, acidic green color. And then in the middle, you've got this uh, opening with a video that slowly morphs of either a mouth or here, in this case, it's an eye. And so Orson was, again, playing around with the whole notion of abstract expressionism as being this instantaneous gesture here. It's very carefully crafted and cut out, uh, very sort of mechanically realized. Next image. And then here are three where you've got artists Horsler and Sarkisian using uh, liquid, looking at states of matter, and uh, again, playing off of resin forms as well as hard cutout forms, and then projecting through those or onto those. And I'm not trying to imply that Sarkisian was looking at Horsler or vice versa, because 
in many cases, uh, one predates the other. I'm just trying to simply put uh, Sarkeesian's work alongside uh, other leading video sculpture artists at the time. Next image. This is purple resonant dust by Tony Orson. It's a large, large piece, about four feet in diameter. And it's made with painted fiberglass. And what you see are uh, various body part images that it's almost like you're looking into a crystal ball. They would come into focus, and then they'll recede, and they sort of swirl around. And there's a mouth that will sometimes uh, say different sentences while all this is going on. And it's again, uh, Orsler combining sculpture and video imagery in really complicated ways. And again, using <coughs> rear, rear projection very much like Sarkisian does. Next image. And so you've got three works that I think uh, have a lot in common by three different artists. Again, uh, Paik wanted to show you the actual chassis of the television is critical and reminding us of the truth of the medium whereas Orsler and Sarkisian are uh, taking snippets of video imagery, sound, with this uh, shaped plastic and creating something very much uh, from the depths of the imagination. Next image. And then here are three works that I thought sort of all landed on the, the whole notion of the cube. The upper left is Orsler's apparition, where he's immersed in this uh, open cube some sort of a very simple uh, form and then projected a face onto that to make it look as if there's a, a drowning or submerged figure. And then the lower left is uh, a revolving lamp. It's actually a piece that you can buy. It's uh, commercially available in a large edition. And uh, the imagery sort of rotates and revolves. And then the upper right is, of course, Hubbard, which we looked at already by Peter Sarkeesian. Next slide. Now, I want you to be aware, I mentioned earlier how complicated the installation of these works is. This is one page from that thick stack of things that Clark and Rob Matt have to go through. And it's all about, again, the distance from the projection to the actual puddle on the floor, the angle of the projection, uh, and just all kinds of uh, brightness settings that have to be accounted for to make sure that the, uh, the final result is exactly what the artist once, and of course the challenge is when you put a show like this on the road, you know, Peter has created these in his studio environment and gotten them all just the way he wants. And then when they go to the Knoxville Museum of Art, our ceiling height is different. The wall color is different. The natural light coming into the lobby affecting the installations is different. Uh, the composition of the floor affects the sound quality. So these are all variables that produce exciting variations, but can also produce technical challenges that we have to overcome. And Peter, fortunately, will be here uh, February 1st through February 10th, and so we'll have his expert on-site assistance, because often we're in the situation of having to make all this happen ourselves, and we hope that we do it according to the artist specifications. In this case, Pete will be here to make sure it's done right. But we know, for instance, that there is one work, the uh, Hover Cube, that we've got a real challenge. The cube is supposed to be uh, dealt with by a projector that's something like 132 inches off the ground. Our galleries downstairs don't have a ceiling that high. So Clark was talking to Peter about well, what are some solutions. And Peter said, you know, I've been playing around with the idea of getting a uh, disc-like mirror, mounting it at 45 degrees, shooting a projection into that and then having it bounce down on the cube, but I haven't perfected that yet, so I don't know, maybe you do that. <laughs> and Clark's sitting there thinking, okay, how would I get the mirror fabricated in time? And, what it, uh, no. and then uh, Peter came up with a better solution. He said he was aware of a projector that would enable him to shorten the distance so that if we bought this projector, we could then mount it on our normal ceiling height upstairs and it would be just fine. So we're going to do that instead, and I definitely immerse them a lot easier because of that. Uh, next image. And I wanted to show you uh, the installation notes for extruded video engine. If you look on the upper left, you'll see the kind of compartment that we have to build. It's basically uh, a false wall. It comes away from the permanent wall, 
it's like a little uh, cubicle. And if you walk around there, you can actually walk into the space. Uh, and there's a special cutout that allows for this form, which comes with the show, to be mounted into that opening. And then behind, once this is mounted behind this wall, you'll see a stack of projectors uh, that all come together to create the solution.